So trilokinumab, very specific IL-13 inhibitor, targets and neutralizes IL-13 uh, by binding to the receptor and preventing the um, messaging. And so the key is a dosing uh, opportunity here. So these patients were studied out to 16 weeks with every uh, two-week dosing, but there's also, once they're well controlled, there's an arm that went to every four weeks. So in every, instead of every other Thursday, if you will, you could go to every fourth Thursday. Um, and that's a great option for certain patients that want to um, decrease their dosing. And I, gener I won't bring this up proactively to the patients. Once they're clear and they're um, compliant and they're doing their dose every other week, I just let them be. I don't bring it up. But if they come in for their six-month follow-up and they're doing great, and they're saying, ah, you know, I'm kind of tired of doing this every other week. Can I get off the medicine? Um, that's the nego where the negotiation begins. And with Trelo, Kinumab, you actually have in the label, they have data showing that patients dosed with that 300 milligram, two shots every four weeks, did very well, very similar, essentially the same as every two week dosing. So that's an option for you. Did did you by chance or clinically have you guys seen the, um, the keratitis uh, risks decrease if you're doing it once monthly versus twice monthly? So um, that's a really important point. When you read the labels for trilokinumab and for uh, dupilumab, there's a warning about eye um, stuff. And the eye stuff that's listed in general um, is conjunctivitis and conjunctivitis like side effects. Um, keratitis is listed also. Keratitis is very different, and keratitis can be a medical emergency and it can lead to blindness. Um, so the question is, was do these medications really induce keratitis, or is it more conjunctivitis? And the atopic dermatitis population um, has endemic eye issues that we didn't really appreciate until the dupilumab studies were enrolling and following people. And there are multiple pre-existing eye conditions that atopic, the atopic population has. And you'll see, when you, when you see them and you're prescribing these medicines, you'll start to ask, hey, have you ever been diagnosed with any pre-existing eye stuff? Um, not just, uh, you know, hay fever, but have you ever gone to the ophthalmologist or have any diagnoses? And you'll see, they'll say, oh, I have keratoconus, or they have, you know, other conditions. And so um, there are pre-existing eye things. The, the real question is, does and do dupilumab and trelo cause keratitis versus a conjunctivitis -y thing? And uh, in my experience, I have not seen anything close to keratitis at all. And so um, I speak more to the other, um, to the other um, side of the spectrum, but I tell patients, I want to know if you have any changes in your eye, anything, uh, you know, itching, any, when you wake up, do you have any crusting? And specifically, if you have any acute changes, uh, we need to know right away or you need to go directly to the emergency room. I apologize, I spoke incorrectly. So conjunctivitis, if, if you've had patients on um, one of those that have had conjunctivitis, if they decrease the frequency of their injections, have you seen the conjunctivitis side effect go away. Yes. I'm or sorry, improve. yes. That, Dr. Sorry. Cohen discussed yeah. that case earlier where he did that. Yeah, I, the lower the dose, the less you have. And I, I look, I, there are, there are, there was in the solo two, I think, uh, there was a patient who, who needed to discontinue because of severe eye inflammation. I have seen episcleritis. It's very, very rare. I may, I may have on one hand count the number of people that had discontinued because of very severe eye inflammation. The irony is that you see this bad eye, you, you see conjunctivitis, again, 10, 15% of the time, very rare uh, episcleritis or really bad eye inflammation, but you don't see it in the asthma patients. You don't see it in the eosinophilic esophagitis patients. You don't see it in the parigonodularis patients that are pure PN. Um, so there's something unique about the eczema patient. That's probably what Joe said, right? They, they already have this disorder 
uh, buried in there. But less is better when you have these issues. And you treat them, you know, there's this a very big component of dry eye from uh, dupilumab, the conjunctivitis. So use wetting drops, right? But don't use bottles of wetting drops. Use the little twisty individual vials because they don't have benzalkonium chloride in them or other preservatives that can be irritating. The bottles are good for your travel bag, but yes, thank you. <laughs> like Vanna White there, just you know. <laughs> right, just like that. Do those regularly. Um, you can use intermittent uh, intraocular steroids, you know, like FML or um, Lodamax, you know, for a day or two to knock it down, particularly if they get conjunctivitis that's severe, like a day or two after the shot, right? You could do that. Um, I've used cyclosporin eye drops a fair amount for that when it's chronic. And every now and again, I'll use um, antihistamine eye drops like Pataday, right, that's over the counter, or mast cell stabilizers like Zatator, right? And, and, and those are easy to get, they're inexpensive, and you just find the right combination for them. But you can, you can go at it. You know, you don't have to stop the drug for that. You can usually get through it. And with time, the frequency goes down. And, I don't, and, and it's not because I think you're losing the patience to the drug. It's not an as-observed effect. I think the quality of the side effect goes down with time. And Lebri does look like this, uh, um, not Lebri, um, Trelo does look like there's less of it, and, and Lebri too, probably. Now, you might come back and say, that's the needle phobia thing. Okay, um, then cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, prednisone, if those are advisable, or if those are inadvisable, how is it possible that the jacks are advisable, right? So it's a little wiggle room. It's what um, April mentioned before. It gives you some room to move here. You could, in that patient who's tortured by her itch, absolutely start the Rinvoke and Simbico, and you could, you know how I would say it? I'd say it that the other small molecules had very little chance of getting rapid itch control uh, than the JAK inhibitors would orally, which showed very rapid relief of itch control. And you make a comment in your note that they're, quote, being tortured by the itch. It's a legitimate reason to pop to that, because you might say, I won't get that kind of control of the itch with the other drugs. But I think what the FDA is saying here, use something else before you go to these first. That's how I read it. So you always start with the lower dose, 15 milligrams, and if you don't get a good response, you can go up to 30 milligrams, time agnostic. And for Abro, if it's not achieved after 12 weeks, don't know where they came up with that because the data doesn't suggest 12 weeks is a good endpoint to wait before you increase the dose. I mean, if you're not seeing something at four to six or eight weeks, it'd be perfectly reasonable to go up to a higher dose there. So this is the initiation questionnaire, um, and it's very comprehensive. We talked a lot today about patient populations that make sense to start a JAK, but we wanted to give really clear guidelines and um, the first questions you want to ask patients, um, number one, um, are they on birth control? You, and get a urine pregnancy test to make sure they're not pregnant. If they are, um, have potential for getting pregnant, they should be started on birth control. Um, you do not want to use these medications in patients that are smokers, so that would be a rule out. These medications, uh, Bosambico and Rimbo, can have um, um, I'm going to actually pause there. Oh, would, you, would you agree with that? Would you not use it in a, in a smoker? Depends on the smoking history, right? So um, if you looked at the EMA guidelines, heavy smokers would be a reason not to use it in someone under 65. And one-third of the Rinvoke patients in the clinical trials were smokers. smokers. Mm -hmm. right. That's a lot. Now, yeah. but however... I think there's a lot of young people who may smoke on Friday and Saturday night when they go out with their friends and maybe have three or four cigarettes or may vape a little bit. That's not going to be, to me, a showstopper. 
right? But a pack or two a day, 10 years, in their 20s, I'm gonna worry about thromboembolic events and, and cardiac risk factors. So it, the, the problem is the EMA and, and, and the labels do not define what's serious smoking. Like smoking a cigarette uh, a, a week is not the same as smoking two packs a day, but they're both considered smokers. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and in general, when you think about a Jack patient, you're thinking about a younger, healthier patient, as we saw earlier in the data. Um, but you also want to look at their, you want to take a deeper dive into their overall health status. Do they have a history of blood clots? If somebody has a history of blood clots, that would be a rule out. I would veer away. If they had a family history of blood clots, probably not enough reason to avoid it. But a personal history, absolutely. Um, overall health status for infections, you want to treat someone with these medicines that's generally healthy. So chronic and recurrent infections is probably not the ideal patient. We talked a lot about malignancy earlier. And then for these patients, prior to initiating them on the oral jacks, you want to have them vaccinated for shingles. So they want to, you want to get the zoster vaccination. And you can write a letter on an old prescription pad to the pharmacist saying, this patient, whether they're 12 or above 18, patient is going to be started on an immunosuppressant agent, um, needs zoster vaccination. Otherwise, they show up at the pharmacy, and the pharmacist says, what? I'm not giving them a zoster vaccination. They're not, a, they're a, you know, not over 50 years old. So, um, and you want to get um, a good history also of whether they have chronic and recurrent cold sores. How, you ever have a cold sore? Oh, okay, yeah, I had one in my life. Well, that's different than somebody that's had every time uh, they go out in the sun, they get a cold sore. They have multiple episodes. And then um, the baseline screening that we talked about earlier, we'll go into specifically on the next slide, um, where you can do baseline screening, baseline screening to evaluate their overall health status. One or two comments. There are familial hypercoagulable states, right? So if there's a, your mom or dad had a, a, a clot at a weird time in their life, you know, maybe they clotted during pregnancy or they clotted after a surgery, Find out what the reason for that is, because there are familial bleeding disorders and clotting disorders. And if it's familial, get them screened. And if they do get herpes all the time, I just put them on uh, Valtrex or Famvir suppressively and then put them on the drug, mm -hmm. right? Um, also, just to add that, um, I think also, you know, while, while older patients were part of the JAK inhibitor studies, um, but it was shown that they are more likely to have laboratory abnormalities than the younger cohorts. So if you do start uh, JAK inhibitor in, in an older patient, uh, 65 years or above, um, you know, just I, I will monitor them a little bit closer just because their risk is higher for, for the, um, some of the blood uh, abnormalities. Uh, and they may have concomitant certain comorbidities that make them, you know, these each little thing can add up. Um, so, so those patients need to be monitored a little closer. And these have drug interactions that you have to run through your yes. screeners. You'll, you'll never remember. Don't ever try to remember drug interactions off the top of your head except things like, you know, Bactrim and methotrexate, like those are warnings. But always run, use your electronic record, use your Hippocrates. You'll never remember all the variability that's there. And just because a drug eruption comes up doesn't mean you can't use the drug. Like, open it up and see. I just had one on a patient I started on abracitinib, and they were on Prozac. And there's a specific warning that Prozac will increase the serum concentration of the abracitinib. So I said, all right, we're going we're gonna to break the 100 in half. And so the worst you'll do is be on 75 or 80 milligrams of abracitinib when you're on the Prozac. Prozac wasn't working that well anyway, but we started her off on it this, just this two, three weeks ago. And she's off the Prozac. I just bumped her up this week to 100 milligrams of abracitinib, and she's now on Welbutrin, which doesn't have that drug interaction. So it, it doesn't mean you can't manage them. You just need to recognize them and document. It's like, 
hey, um, anyone reading this note, I'm aware of the drug interaction. I didn't miss it, but it, I'm, I'm gonna mitigate the risk of that drug interaction. And then you're clear, like you're good. 